a very good afternoon to all the participants, uh, my colleagues, and I also welcome uh, Dr. Sebastian for today's webinar. Uh, I welcome uh, all of you to the webinar series of JSIA 2020, and I hope uh, all of you are safe and doing well. Uh, as you know, that today's topic for the webinar is major trends in the political economy of illicit drugs, evidence from the Americas, and it will be presented by Dr. Sebastian today. Uh, Dr. Sebastian is an assistant professor at General School of International Affairs. He earned his PhD in International Studies from the University of Miami. In addition to uh, his Fulbright scholarship, the organization that funded his studies in the United States, Dr. Katrina has uh, held scholarship from United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, uh, the Latin America Studies Association, the Santander Bank, among others. His most recent book that has been published by Rotledge in 2017 is Challenging the US-led War on Drugs, Argentina in Comparative Perspective. Uh, Dr. Sevenshen has taught drug trafficking and organized crime at University of Miami, US, and uh, uh, University of uh, Nacional de la Raza, Argentina. His research interest mainly consists in organized crime, drug policy, and Latin American politics. So I now uh, welcome uh, Dr. Sebastian to uh, start with his presentation. We will also take questions after his session, and uh, you know we would be there to uh, answer any questions related to uh, you know academics as well as admissions. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon to anyone. Uh, I thank you for attending this webinar today. We are going to be discussing uh, topics that are connected to the political economy of illicit drugs, focusing on the Americas. So to begin with, I would like to talk a little bit about certain definitions that are important in order to approach the major trends and patterns in the Americas. The first one is, what is the political economy of illicit drugs? Many of you may have heard concepts like drug trafficking, organized crime, the drug trade, but the political economy of illicit drug, it's a broader concept that encompasses the supply trafficking and consumption of narcotics and how each of these uh, phenomena interacts. So in order to understand how this works, we have to pay attention to the supply. Uh, we're going to be talking about the production and manufacturing of narcotics. Those are two completely different phenomena. Uh, we're going to be talking about trafficking, the transportation, the smuggling, and micro-trafficking as well. Those are different activities that are, are somehow connected to the trafficking of narcotics in, in the Americas. We're also be, uh, addressing the consumption trends in the Americas, but sometimes we're also uh, be analyzing what happened in other regions around the world. And finally, uh, an activity that is sometimes not connected to drug trafficking, but it's very important, particularly in the context of globalization, which is money laundering. I mean, what are the different activities that are connected to drug trafficking that help this phenomenon to foster internationally? So first, let's see what are the factors that shape this political economy of illicit drugs. We know that consumption has changed. We know that we have more countries or more people that are using drugs internationally. We know that smuggling has become a very regular activity around the world, but we don't know what are the factors behind the transformation of the political economy of illicit drugs. Today, I want to focus on two particular uh, phenomena that help to explain this transformation internationally and more particularly in the Americas. The first one is the markets. So we have to pay attention to the patterns of consumption. We have to pay attention also to the levels of production and manufacturing, but also the efficacy of transportation. Those are 
variables that are connected to the market. So in order to understand the patterns and changes throughout the last years, we have to pay attention to those three specific indicators that are part of the market of illicit drugs. But it's not all about the market. Many people believe that if we uh, analyze how consumption has changed, we know uh, why this happened and why are these changes altering the political economy of this drug. We have to pay attention to another relevant factor. Otherwise, how can we explain, for example, that countries that have the same consumption levels have different rates of violence, for example? Let me use an example to illustrate this. The United States is today the biggest market for illicit drugs. Uh, the consumption rates in the United States are above all the countries around the world. Nevertheless, the production of narcotics is not happening in the United States. It's not happening in the United States, but it's happening in countries of the Andean region. It is happening in Colombia and Peru and Bolivia, for example. So how can we explain that drugs that are produced in the Andean Ridge move to the United States where the use of narcotics is very high? We have to pay attention to a second factor in addition to the market. That factor is the state. We have to look at the state. The state, uh, through different actions, uh, can favor or disrupt drug trafficking activities, both domestically and internationally. Let's see how the state works internationally. The state influences the behavior of criminal organization and drug trafficking groups by increasing or decreasing the risk of engaging in those activities. Let me talk about some of the actions that we often understand as the major political decisions promoted by the states. First, penalties. We know that by increasing penalties, sometimes the state decreases the level of consumption because the population believes that using drugs could lead them to jail. That is one example. Another different activity that uh, the state usually develops in order to curb the use of drugs is by interdiction. So we have witnessed, for example, how seizures activities in Latin America have moved the consumption of illicit drugs from one place to another in order to avoid interdiction alternatives in the Americas. We have a third uh, action promoted by the state, which is imprisonment. I mean, you can uh, bring the users of drugs and traffickers into jail and that action particularly helps to curb the use of drugs and also the trafficking around the world but it's not all about good news the state also can produce unintended consequences and the state also can have different actions that in contrast to the disruption of drug trafficking sometimes favors the appearance and the proliferation of criminal groups that are devoted to the black market internationally. What are these actions? Corruption. You know that uh, corrupt elite governments sometimes use the money coming from drug trafficking to finance, for example, political campaigns. We also have infiltration. We know different countries around the world, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the situation in the Americas, in which states, and particularly state institutions, have been infiltrated by organized crime, hampering somehow the uh, effectivity of different counter narcotic efforts. We have cooperation in certain places around the world, and in Central America, sometimes the state and elite uh, usually cooperate with certain activities of organized crime in order to attack other groups of criminal activities. We have the last affair, for example, in which states uh, have not decided to attack drug trafficking and to counter narcotics internationally. But let's see how this interaction between the state and the market 
has evolved throughout the years. I'm going to talk today, and this is the center of my presentation, about three different phenomena and three different patterns in the political economy of illicit drugs that are the result of both of the driving forces that we have discussed previously, namely the market and the role of the state. The first pattern or the first phenomenon that I want to address is the so-called balloon effect. Balloon effect is the process by which narcotic production is displaced from one region to another in order to evade eradication or interdiction efforts. Let me use some examples to illustrate this phenomenon internationally. In the late 70s and beginnings of the 80s, the two countries that were the major producers of coca leaf around the world were Peru and Bolivia, in that order. Between both countries, they account for 80 or 90 percent of the world production of coca leaf that is used to produce cocaine internationally. Due to different counter-narcotic efforts developed in Bolivia and in Peru at the beginnings of the 80s, that production, that supply of these narcotics, shifted to Colombia at the beginnings of the 90s. You may have seen documentaries, you may have seen even uh, Netflix series in your TV, where the two major cartels, the Cali and Medellin cartels in Colombia, took advantage of this situation in Colombia. So production moved from Peru and Bolivia in the 80s to Colombia in the 90s. And Colombia became, by the late 90s, in the major producer of illicit drugs, reversing the trend in which Peru and Bolivia were the major players in Latin America. At the beginnings of the 90s, nevertheless, the government of Gaviria started a strategy called the Kingpin strategy. So he went after the kingpins of the two cartels in Colombia, tackling those organizations and removing them from the market of illicit drugs. What happened after those actions and the signing of Plan Colombia in 1999 in the region? Production and the supply of illicit drugs moved back from Colombia again to Peru and Bolivia. So in 2013, Peru became the major producer of coca leaf and cocaine internationally. So we understand this phenomenon as the balloon effect. Why the balloon effect? Because if you put some pressure in one part of the production, production does not disappear, but move to another place. And that's why we use this analogy to describe how difficult has been the development of different counter-narcotic efforts to stop the supply. The bottom line means that the production has shifted from one place to another, but the overall levels of supply have remained the same, or they have even increased throughout the years. The second effect is the so-called cockroach effect. I don't know if you have ever uh, turned on the light when you are in a dark place, what happens with cockroach? Cockroach does not, does not disappear, but they go to different places. And this is the analogy that drug policy specialists use to describe the dispersion and fragmentation of criminal groups within country and across sub-region. Let me use another example to illustrate this second trend in the political economy of illicit drugs. During the 90s, the only two organizations that were in charge of production of illicit drugs in the Americas were the Medellin cartel on the one hand and the Cali cartel on the other hand. Nevertheless, in 1993, the kingpin of the Medellin cartel was assassinated, Pablo Escobar, and in 1995, the leaders of the Cali cartel, the Orejuela brothers, were in prison and later sent to the United States. What happened with organized crime and drug trafficking? Did organized crime disappear because of the tackling of the two major cartels? No, organized crime did not disappear. Organized crime fragmented into different cells that 
do exactly the same. They traffic drugs, but they did it very differently. So organized crime not only fragmented within Colombia, and now we have different and smaller cells of the two biggest organizations, but organized crime also moved from Colombia to Mexico. And that is why we uh, had only one cartel in the 80s in Mexico, and now we are have more than 100 cartels in Mexico. That shift from one cartel to more than 10 cartels or even 100 cartels in Mexico today is the result of the so-called cockroach effect. The state, the iron fest of the state has not disappeared the presence of these organizations, but it has fragmented them. The bad news about these two um, trends is that the product today is the consequence of the first two. What happened with consumption? So we know that the production has moved around the, uh, the Latin American scenario. We know that criminal organizations have moved from one place to another, that criminal organizations have also fragmented in Latin America. But what happened with consumption? The bad news about these two first phenomena is that cons consumption has globalized. There is a famous uh, scholar that in the United States wrote a famous book called The American Disease. He used this book to describe consumption internationally. So he said that consumption was a problem of the United States of America at the beginnings of the 60s and 70s. That situation changed. Today we have similar levels of consumption and use of drugs in Europe in the southern form and even in certain places of Africa. Nigeria is increasing its levels of consumption throughout the years. So the overall picture, and despite the action of the state, has been negative. The production has moved, criminal organizations have fragmented, and globalization of consumption has been the third phenomenon experienced in Latin America, but also international. So why is the state so important? Why is it important to understand the role of the state? Because its action can be positive or can have unintended consequences. In addition to the transformations within the political economy of illicit drugs, the patterns that we have discussed a few minutes before, the action of the state has also exacerbated the levels of violence in Latin America. Probably you don't know how violent is the continent today as a result of the actions of the state, as a result of those unintended consequences. But let me tell you that between 2000 and 2010, more than 1 million people died in Latin America as a result of criminal violence, as a result of the action of different criminal groups that sold drugs in Latin America. The murder rate in the region grew by 11%, registering more than 100,000 homicides per year. You can try to find an equivalent with the COVID-19 to see how powerful was this phenomenon in Latin America. The region is home to eight of the top 10 most violent countries and 40 of the world's 50 most dangerous cities. Those are figures, of course, that are not only a result of the institutional setting of Latin America, but also the result of the actions of the state that have tried to stop and to curb drug trafficking in Latin America, but had the exact and opposite result. How about drugs? What happened after more than 30 or 40 years of the war on drugs in Latin America. Many of these actions we understood today had unintended consequences. We know that the production has moved, we know that organized crime has fragmented, we know that 
um, globalization of consumption has happened as well in different places around the world. But what happened with the drugs? Because the drugs were the goal of many governments that developed different counter-narcotic efforts in Latin America. The results have been negative. Today, after more than 40 years of state action in Latin America, drugs are purer, are cheaper, and are more available today than they were in the 1970s. So we can say that uh, and conclude that the state action in Latin America and the role of the state in trying to fight organized crime and drug trafficking has been a complete failure in the continent. I would like to close this presentation by trying to address some of the challenges for Latin America that can be also applied in different regions around the world. So if we know that putting some pressure and militarizing the fight against narcotics and going after the kingpin is not the best strategy to stop the trafficking and to reduce the levels of consumption, what can we do in order to uh, stop this trend in the Americas? I would say that there are three major challenges that we have to address in our continent, but we can also think the same in other regions around the world. The first one is we have to concentrate our security efforts on drug trafficking and logistics. Some of the problems in Latin America is that rule of law has been accelerated, but only in terms of the use of drugs. People behind bars today are mostly the people that have violated the drug law in their respective countries. We do not have many drug traffickers. We do not have many kingpins behind bars. So the rule of law has been uh, applied mostly to small users of illicit drugs instead of being applied to drug trafficking organizations. That is why I argue that we have to concentrate our security efforts on drug trafficking and not only on the user of illicit drugs. The second challenge, and perhaps this is the most important one, is that we have to find a multilateral solution to this problem. We have to address drug trafficking through international cooperation. Every time that one government applies a counter-narcotic effort in one country, what happens is that production moves. Production does not disappear. Criminal groups does not, do not disappear. They move from one place to another. And that is the, the cockroach effect and the balloon effect that we have discussed today. So in order to tackle the phenomena, we need international cooperation. We need institutions that address the problem in Latin America, but also internationally at the same time. And finally, I think that the third major challenge in Latin America and internationally is to find an alternative development path. We cannot only put people behind bars, but we also have to give the population alternative means of development. Otherwise, we would still pushing people to illicit activities and to the black market. We need alternative development projects in Latin America to tackle the problem of drug trafficking and organized crime. To wrap up this conversation, again, the only way to learn from the past and to avoid committing the same mistakes today in Latin America is first to concentrate our security efforts on drug trafficking and logistics, to foster international cooperation in the field, and finally, to promote an alternative development path in order to fight against this phenomenon. I think more or less that is what I've tried to do. It's just an introductory uh, discussion about organized crime and drug trafficking, but I'll be more than glad to address uh, your comments or questions or suggestions about the topic. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sebastian, and 
you know, it reminded me of uh, Narcos and Pablo Escobar. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very interesting and uh, I'm sure you are. Uh, we are now uh, ready to take questions. Uh, I have our first question from Sanika. And the question is, what are the international implications of legalization of illicit drugs? Okay, uh, that's a very good question indeed. Let me start by saying that um, we have many countries today that have decided to follow a different path. The idea that putting people behind bars is not the answer has been developed not only in countries like Uruguay, in South America, or Canada in the Americas, but also within the United States. So the international implications are that we have not found cooperative networks to address this problem. Let me tell you an example so you can understand how this uh, phenomenon operates in many regions around the world. In uh, 2001, uh, Portugal decriminalized the use of drugs. What happened and what were the major international implications were that many people from neighboring countries moved to Portugal in order to use drugs at the very beginning. So they used the Portuguese territory to develop some of the activities that were, they were uh, developing in their own uh, countries before the decriminalization in 2001. The long story short is that if we not address this phenomenon internationally, we can create problems for those countries. Something similar happened in South America. Many users of marijuana in South America have moved to Uruguay. They only have to travel 10, 20 kilometers from Paraguay or from Argentina in order to use drugs. They have opened their own enterprises in that country before the country passes a law that prohibited um, the use of drugs by tourists. But at the very beginning, that happens. The implications are that if we do not work multilaterally to tackle this phenomenon, we may have unintended consequences. We, we may experience and we may witness the appearance of different criminal groups that are not from that country, but they start operating there because the regulation and legislation in that country is more flexible than in their origins. Thank you so much. Uh, our next question is from uh, Divyanshu Srivastava, and uh, his question is, can the policy of immigration and getting used to of social customs of the Western culture increases the consumption of the illicit drugs? Your comments on this, please. I think that, um, I don't think that it's all about culture. You know, one of the driving forces, perhaps a few of the driving forces that have been empirically tested to see how and when we can expect the rise in consumption in different countries. The first one is uh, urbanization. We, when we experience and we, we witness uh, rapid urbanization in countries, we may expect as well the presence of high levels of consumption. Urbanization is one of the driving forces that have been studied so far. The other driving force that uh, somehow predict the rise in consumption um, is the appearance of the middle class. When you have a middle class that is growing within the country, you may expect that middle class to use narcotics as well. So economic development is somehow connected, the growth of the middle class as well, urbanization. But I think that despite the driving forces of use of drugs, I think that our major and most important challenge in terms of keeping that uh, phenomenon constrained and contained is to work very hard to assure that the use of drug is not translated into violence. We have countries with incredibly high levels of drug consumption, but that drug consumption has not been translated into violence. That is not happening in Latin America. What I'm trying to say to conclude to this question is that 
most of the efforts, in my opinion, should be concentrated in building our institutions in order to prevent not only the use of drugs, but most importantly, to prevent that that use of drugs is not translated into violence. How do we do that? We do that by creating alternative paths to development, by strengthening the law enforcement of the country, but also by creating a network between the countries, neighboring countries, to approach the topic multilateral. Thank you so much uh, for that. And we move on to the next question by Aditya, Aditya Ramakrishnan. His question is, uh, do you think bodies like the UNODC have addressed the questions of uh, international cooperation? Have they been successful in framing effective international legislation to combat drug trafficking? What obstacles do you think such bodies face in terms of their mandate? And if what measures do you think they can take to improve? Yeah, uh, that's a very, very good question. I think that the multilateral framework so far has been a complete failure. Uh, our main legislation internationally that comprises all the countries members of the United Nations is the 1961 Single Convention Against Narcotics. That is the framework of the legislation internationally that not only created uh, different lists or schedules of narcotics that are included in each of the lists, but also promotes and sometimes pressure governments to promote national legislation. I say that it was a complete failure because it has not been successful in identifying different landscape international. Let me tell you a story about one of the countries that is a member of that uh, international organization that and has not found any answers in the 1961 single convention. The, the, 90, the 1961 single convention establishes that coca leaf is more dangerous than cocaine. That is true, it's a little bit unbelievable, but it puts in the first place coca leaf instead of cocaine. And many physicians and specialists on the topic know that cocaine is one of the hardest drugs and perhaps one of the most dangerous ones, but it's not placed in the first place. And this happened because that legislation was passed in the 60s when the problem of cocaine was not widespread in the United States. So the United States pressured the members of that international institution to include coca leaf instead of cocaine. Coca leaf is an ingredient used in the production of, co of cocaine, but it's not a drug itself. Nevertheless, the Bolivian government, and this is the case study that I want to address, the Bolivian government has faced many problems in order to find an alternative path of development because coca leaf, which is a very common and regular product in the country was prohibited by the 1961 single convention. The long story short is that we have not found so far uh, a multilateral framework that recognizes the specificities of each of the countries that are members of the United Nations. There is a project right now that is trying to reform that uh, multilateral institutional framework, but has not been successful so far. I would say that the only way that these intentions and these efforts could uh, be successful is to trust in other countries, because the United States has been pressuring, and this is contradictory, because the United States has been pressuring uh, to increase penalties within the framework of the United Nations, but on the other hand, has legalized drugs internally. There are more than 16 states within the United States that have legalized the use of drugs. So we need to work on a new legislation internationally. And in order to do so, we need the participation of the countries that are hit by the phenomenon of drug trafficking. We need to consult what the Colombians would do. We need to consult the people from Bolivia 
we need to consult people from Iran, Afghanistan, who, who are somehow involved in this political economy of leaky zones. If we only reproduce the image and the understanding of the United States and try to promote that image internationally without recognizing the specificities of, we, of each country, I think we will keep committing the same mistakes. Thank you so much. Uh, our next question is from uh, Prasanna Ganesh. And he says, uh, thank you for bringing focus on one of the most ignored con continent in Indian foreign policy. And his question is, uh, how does drugs from LSE affect India, number one? If it does affect, what should India do about it? Should we, uh, should we use this element alone in deepening our relationship with Latin America? Your comment on this, please. I think that I'm not, uh, I'll begin by saying that I'm not a specialist in India. I'm trying to promote right now a research agenda on the topic, and I invite all those prospective students to join this agenda because I think that this phenomenon in India, it's not well known. I mean, we do not have uh, much information about what is happening in India. Unlike, I'm going to say, nevertheless, some uh, important patterns that describe the situation in the country. I will start by saying that, unlike Latin America, you do not have a big problem in terms of cocaine. Um, the use of drugs in India is mostly connected to marijuana, and in certain cases, connected to opium. Why is this happening? Because India is placed in the road of opium from the countries that produce opium to develop, for example, heroin. And it's not placed in the middle of the road that connects cocaine with the market of the United States. So I think one of the main differences to begin with is to say that the cocaine problem is not as, I would say, at least in relative terms, it's not as big as in the Americas. But you are starting, and I've checked some of the uh, levels of consumption throughout the years, you are starting to experience some problem in some of the uh, metropolitan centers of the country. I think that the most um, difficult places are Mumbai in the first uh, place, but also other uh, coastal states like Goa in, 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 the, in, the, in the left side of the, of the country. So I think that uh, we need to do some research in the case of India. That's why I am trying to promote this uh, research project in this continent, because we do not have to wait till the problem is very, very uh, big. We need to start thinking about the alternatives that we have internationally. And the good thing about India is that it's going to face problems connected to drug trafficking in a moment where we have a lot of experiences around the world and we can learn about them. We can learn about the punitive paradigm in the United States. We can learn about decriminalization in Portugal. We can also learn something about uh, legalization in countries like Canada or Uruguay. And I think that learning from those different examples, we can start uh, preventing what could happen in the future. My major, major, um, I would say, I, I'm a bit afraid, it's because uh, no one discusses this problem in India. And I think that policymakers should be aware that probably it's not a problem right now, but it could be in the future. So part of our uh, strategy would be also to create a research uh, project in the university that first created the diagnosis and that we need a very strict diagnosis of the problem and then some policy alternatives. So when the problem arrives to the country, we have different alternatives to propose to government officials. Thank you so much. Uh, our next question is from uh, Anantaram Sundara Babu. And his question is, how do you see the Dutch model of legalizing the wheat 
and uh, how did that work? I think that uh, first of all, uh, something that I, I think that I mentioned, but I want to emphasize again, we have to think this model in terms of the context. We cannot extrapolate or move one model to another country. We have to take into consideration the economy. We have to take into consideration social variables. We have to take into consideration different aspects of each country in order to at least think in how possible it would be to apply that model. I think that in the case of uh, the Dutch has been quite successful. But I think that the most uh, contradictory uh, measure is that for those who don't know the Dutch model, it, it's not completely legalized. It is not legalized, as a matter of fact. It is only permitted to use marijuana within the coffee shop. So you can use either marijuana or cannabis in the coffee shop, but if you use cannabis or marijuana outside the coffee shops, you can go to jail. The problem is that the law is somehow contradictory because it allows the it allows the use within coffee shop, but at the same time, it pressures those that bring drugs into the coffee shop. So let's say that you are the owner of this place that is uh, registered in the government, you are allowed to sell drugs within the coffee shop. But if someone brings that drug inside the place and it's cut just in the door of that place, it goes to jail. So I think that part of the failure has been not to address the three stages of drugs. You need to address not only the use of drugs, but you also need to address the traffic, and you also need to address the manufacturing and the production of these drugs. And the Dutch model has only focused on the use of narcotics and has left the other two stages without uh, being part of the policy reform that the government developed in the late uh, 70s. And I think that another unintended consequence is what is called the uh, drug tourism. Many members of the European Union traveled to uh, Holland to use drugs. And unlike the Uruguayan government, it has not developed a very strict policy in order to prohibit that uh, trend in Europe. And I think that uh, that is also an illustration of how important it is to pass legislation that address the problem of drugs internationally and not only focusing on one specific country. Thank you so much, Professor. And uh, we take the next question from uh, Sumalata Chaitanya. And the question is, uh, Golden Crescent area in Asia and its direct link to terrorism and uh, illicit drug infiltration to its neighboring countries, thereby affecting the youth. What effective international effort is needed to uproot this crime? Um, the, the use by teenagers and young population, that is the country, the, the yeah. question? The youth, yes. I, I, I don't think we have a very effective uh, policy to, to address this, this issue. I think that uh, part of the um, explanation that I've tried to, to develop today is that uh, we are sometimes uh, developing counter-narcotic efforts in specific countries, but we have unintended consequences on neighbors. So if we apply something similar, let's say in India, we may expect the rise in the use and trafficking in Pakistan or in other uh, neighboring countries. So I think we have not developed a multilateral approach to illicit drugs. We need, and I think that is one of our major uh, challenges because so far we only have national initiatives that try to approach the topic domestically but sometimes have had very important and relevant unintended consequences. Um, I would start uh, by finding regional responses. So I think that knowing what Thailand, what India, Pakistan, and the members of the Golden Triangle are doing in this respect, it's first step to find in a second stage a multilateral approach to drug trafficking. Because if we put only pressure in one country, 
we learned from the lecture today that pressure pushes the use of drugs and pushes the traffic into neighboring countries without affecting the general levels of use at the very beginning, but also without affecting levels of trafficking internationally. Thank you so much. Uh, our next question is from Abhishek Kumar. And this question is, what's your views on the state-driven hybrid war strategy of using drugs to fuel terrorism and to achieve its strategic motives? With respect to Pakistan's use of narco-terrorism in Kashmir, what can be the response of India? Do we have any example of responses by the state to deter such nefarious designs in the Americas? Yes, we do have. Uh, let me start by saying uh, that for those who are not very familiar with the topic, of course, terrorism and organized crime are two completely different uh, phenomena, right? Terrorism has political goals uh, and drug trafficking and, and organized hand crime has economic goals. So people involved in drug trafficking and organized crime usually try to make money, to make profit. They do not have a political goal. That said, it is also true that sometimes terrorism and narco-trafficking get together and they work together. I think we have here a very clear uh, example in India after the bomb attack uh, in Mumbai, how that phenomenon, which is mostly connected to terrorism, uh, start having some link with drug trafficking in Pakistan in the aftermath. Uh, what have been done in Latin America? I would say that the most relevant counter-narcotic but also counter-terrorism approach has been the development of Plan Colombia in 1999. In 1999, President Pastrana from Colombia and President Clinton from the United States signed this agreement to fight against narcotics. The first goal was to fight against narcotics and, and organized crime from 1999 onwards. Nevertheless, with the arrival of uh, President Uribe in Colombia, they reframed, they reframed the plan Colombia and start fighting against narco-terrorism. So the goal was not only to fight drug criminal organizations, but also to fight the FARC, the revolutionary forces of Colombia. And I think that uh, at least in the first stage of flying Colombia, it has been very successful. But again, uh, in the mid and long term, there were some unintended consequences. I would say that we have to learn a lot about Colombia after more than 20 years of the war on drugs and despite those unintended consequences, today the terrorist cells that were operating have finally demobilized in Colombia. Uh, so I think that the answer is not only by militarizing the fight against narco-terrorism or terrorism, but also creating intelligence networks by fighting and being also helped by other countries uh, and we can learn a little bit about what happened in, in, in Latin America. I'm not a specialist about the region, India and Pakistan, but I would say that unlike other uh, places around the world, here we can find some connection between um, terrorism and drug trafficking. And why not we can learn about what the Colombian government, helped by the United States of the century, did fight this connection between narco narco um, drug trafficking sorry and terrorism thank you so much uh, i have our next question uh, again from anand Ram. and this question is uh, how did the covid-19 affect the, uh, the illicit drug logistics uh, can, can you please repeat the, the question sorry yeah sure uh, how did the covid-19 affect the drug logistics i'm not sure what the 19 uh, is uh, covid 19 the pandemic the, that's currently oh, going okay. on okay 
Okay, thank you. Thank so how, you. how did it uh, affect the uh, the uh, the logistical aspect of the drugs? Thank you. That, that's a great question. Uh, I think it, ha it has been very uh, harmful for criminal organizations and particularly for drug trafficking. Why has it been so harmful for drug trafficking and criminal organizations? Let me explain and elaborate a bit on this. Um, drug trafficking and organized crimes often, most of the time, uses the uh, logistic and infrastructure developed by the state. Organized crime does not build forts does not build airports. They do not have uh, airplanes that uh, land in official airports. They do not have cargoes that transport uh, things from one continent to another. Organized crime and drug trafficking, most of the time, use the logistic and the infrastructure of the state. So if that logistic and that infrastructure is disrupted, in this case by the coronavirus, also, their activities are disrupted. Of course, we cannot draw conclusions for the whole world about this, but I'm going to say that in Latin America has been very harmful for criminal organizations. They do not have the chance now to move and to smuggle uh, cocaine, for example, from the Colombian co um, country to the United States because we don't have airplanes, because we don't have uh, vessels that travel to the United States. So it has been very, very hard. On the other hand, let me tell you, there are other examples in which criminal organizations have benefited, and this is probably to a lesser extent, but they have benefited from the coronavirus. There is a very interesting piece that appeared in the Italian newspaper uh, last week that shows how the absence of the state in many small towns in the south of Italy was occupied, that vacuum bus was occupied by criminal networks, by mafia groups, those mafia organizations, because the state was absent there in the south of the, the country, occupied that vacuum and started providing certain services that the state was not providing them. So they, all, they also provide services like garbage recollection, they provide services like uh, water, they provide services like um, sometimes uh, money to buy uh, ingredients to, to make food. So different services that were originally provided by the state has been replaced by organized crime. But the bottom line is that despite certain specific examples in which organized crime has benefited uh, from this pandemic internationally, I would say that uh, as the state and government are suffering the consequences of the coronavirus, the criminal networks are also experiencing the same trend. They cannot move, they cannot smuggle their different products because the architecture, the infrastructure, and the trafficking roads have been practically collapsed. Thank you so much, Professor. We now take uh, two more questions uh, in this webinar. So uh, my next question is a combination of uh, two questions, one from Aditya and the other one uh, is from Vishnu uh, Hari Kumar. Uh, the question is, what do you think of the role uh, pop culture has played in promoting consumption of illicit drugs? And the second part of the question is from Vishnu, uh, which says, uh, you know, if the states are not able to contain and you know, you know uh, the spread of uh, illicit drugs, uh, what is your opinion of uh, bringing the, uh, the you know the drug market into mainstream? Okay, let, let me first address the, the first part of the, of the question, and then probably I'm going to ask you to repeat the, the second one. Sorry, uh, about the third, first one, I think that. Uh, we have an example in history, particularly in the 60s and 70s, where pop culture was connected to the use of drugs. That happened in the United States. The use of marijuana was somehow connected to mobile stations and even the fight against the involvement of the United States in the Vietnam War. So we have this hippie culture, this pop culture that was uh, 
uh, indirectly, I would say, connected to uh, the use of, of drugs. Uh, I don't find another example internationally because I think that despite we have those two phenomena happening at the same time in the United States, culture, uh, the use of marijuana, and later the use of cocaine, I think that the driving forces are fractal, are not. Uh, there could be some connection there, but I think that uh, the, the, the structural forces are even more important. Those structural forces are connected to economic development, to the rise of the middle class, to liberties, to the pass of legislation that provide a liberty to, to many citizens, and also, I think, to the U.S. foreign policy. I think it was connected. It was part of the same mobilizations uh, during the 60s and 70s, particularly. But it is very difficult to find a causal connection. I would say if we run a regression about uh, pop culture and the use of drugs, of course, they could be connected. But I don't think one is the causal factor of the other. They were funded in the same place and the same decade in the United States. But I don't think that pop culture itself is a driving force of the use of drugs. Could you please um, repeat the second part of the question? Yeah, sure. The second part uh, is from Vishnu. And the question is, uh, how about bringing uh, narcotics to mainstream markets because governments are unable to contain them? So what's your thought on this? About bringing narcotics to the mainstream market. Uh, I, I, I don't 100% understand the rational of the, the, the question. Um, I would say that uh, it is better to have legislation that address uh, narcotic use than do not have it. I don't completely understand what it means to bring it to the mainstream market. Um, but I would say that uh, countries need to be prepared in terms of having legislation. I don't, I, in the case of India, for example, I think that um, domestic security has been mostly uh, linked to terrorism. And because of that connection throughout the years, uh, the government has not paid too much attention to narcotics. Uh, even though there are certain agencies within, within the government that work in the field of counter-narcotics, I think that we need to uh, start working right now in order to prevent what could happen in the future. We need uh, the best legislation, we need law enforcement, but also we need to uh, visualize what could be alternative development path for those that otherwise would become involved in the business of drug trafficking. Thank you so much, Professor. We take the last question uh, uh, for in today's forum, and the question is from Raymond, and his question is, how botched up is the U.S. narcotics investigation on Venezuela president? Okay, there is a, a big, big connection there. Despite what Trump is saying, uh, there is a connection. There is something uh, demagogic about uh, drug, um, about uh, Donald Trump in terms of uh, Venezuela and drug trafficking, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the empirics. I mean, what the empirical evidence suggests about the connection between Venezuela, the drug market in the United States, and Colombia. One of the uh, major organizations operating in Colombia is the so-called Cartel de los Soles, or in English would be the Sun Cartel. It's why someone would name or label some cartel to a cartel. Uh, and the rationale of this labeling is that the sun are the image used by military officers in Venezuela. So we call them the sun cartels in, Colum in, in Venezuela because many of the members of the Maduro government are actually part of these 
huge cartel that today is buying drugs from Colombia and smuggling into the United States. Uh, that said, and I think that there is a lot of empirical evidence, if you pay attention, for example, to seizures in Central America and in the Caribbean, most of them uh, can be traced back to Venezuela. Drugs that are shipped from Venezuela, which is used as a transshipment, and then enter into the United States, or in other cases, going through Mexico to be later uh, deposited in the United States. But away and aside from the empirical evidence, I'm going to say that in terms of funds foreign policy and the deployment of the Navy in the Caribbean, I would say that uh, President, and this is my personal opinion, it is more uh, interested in creating uh, or in placing the topic in the agenda rather than uh, fighting uh, drug trafficking in Venezuela. What are the topics that are sometimes framed within the same phenomenon? First of all, the need to tackle President Maduro. Some people believe that it's not a president, others believe that it's a president, but the United States has um, said in many times that they support Guaido, who is the leader of the opposition. So I think there is a foreign policy a rationale there. The U.S. government is more interested in promoting the figure of Guaido uh, rather than fighting drug trafficking itself. I think the U.S. is also trying to securitize drug trafficking. The government is now entering into an economic recession, and it's good to have in the agenda another topic uh, in addition to the economic recession. So having always a foreign enemy like the Chinese and the COVID-19 or even drug trafficking could be a good alternative co to conceal what is happening within the economy, which is a growing economic recession and the impact that that recession could have in the next elections in November. Uh, Professor Sebastian, I think uh... You know, the session was, uh, you know, very informative, uh, very in important. And uh, in fact, uh, I have some of us, uh, the participants sending thank you note about the subject today. And uh, they hope to hear uh, such interesting uh, subjects and topics uh, during uh, some of our webinars. So maybe, you know, we can, uh, we can again get back to you and with some interesting topic. So, uh, well, thank you so much for uh, you know such a wonderful uh, webinar today. Uh, I want to quickly inform all the applicants for the uh, undergraduate program who are uh, who are uh, looking to apply or who have already applied for our political science or global affairs program. Uh, our JSAT registrations uh, online, wherein you can take the test from home, is now open from today. So uh, you could visit the JSAT website, and if you have not registered yet, please register yourself and send us the registration details. If you face any problem, you will, uh, you know, while registering, or you, if you want, are also looking to change your registration dates, uh, you can get in touch with the toll-free number, uh, which is given on the website of PSNBO, the JSAT website. Uh, but if you still have problems, you can always get in touch with the JSI admissions team. Uh, you have a contact details so yes thank you so much uh, once again uh, professor and uh, we hope to get back to you with some more interesting uh, topics like today thank you thank you so much uh, let me uh, close just by saying yeah, that sure. uh, of course uh, any of the students that are is interested in the topic they can uh, find my email in the web page of the program they can write me an email and i think that this is part of the uh, strength of this program right the idea of not only addressing what institution and government is, but also in fact, I mean, we need to be prepared not only in terms of research projects, but also to train government officials and are aware of these uh, problems that are occurring around the world. And I think that this program is very helpful in this respect. Uh, Professor, would you like to suggest some kind of a reading to our students who are interested in this topic? You know, if they just want to uh, go back and read something. 
Yes, for sure. Uh, ca can I leave the, my, my email in the chat box? Yeah, sure, you can do that. So, the, the, yeah, I'm going to do that so they can write me an email. I have a, um, a very interesting list of references. And let me also tell the, the, the people attended the, the seminar that we have seminars like this uh, in our program. We will be dealing with drug trafficking, transnational organized crime around the world. So uh, please do not hesitate to write me an email and I can, of course, give you more information about what we can be studying in the future in case you finally decide to join this very wide and interesting project. I'm going to leave my email here. One second. Here. Chat box. Depending on the specific area of interest, I can suggest uh, literature about. So if some of the uh, prospective students are, let's say, interested in the Golden Triangle, they want to know what Thailand is doing in terms of drug trafficking, what are the counter narcotic policies developed in that country, I can suggest some literature. If the students uh, are interested in Europe or in North America, so some very relevant literature that I can suggest. I have just left my my email in the Dropbox, in the email in the chat box. And please do not hesitate to uh, email me if you have any question or you are interested in some specific topic that we can discuss in the future. Thank you so much, uh, uh, you know, Professor Sebastian. And uh, once again, I, I really appreciate all the participants who have attended this webinar. Thank you and have a good day.